today, at some point, you heard this. There's an Asian man running for president who wants to give everyone $1,000. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that? Remember the first time you heard that? And the first time you heard that, you're like, ha ha, that's a gimmick. That's too good to be true. But this is a deeply American idea that's been with us since our founding. Thomas Paine was for it at the very beginning of the country, called it the Citizens Dividend. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Flat Earth Channel, where you can access the latest U.S. news. Democratic presidential candidate Andrew Yang participates in the Civil Liberties in the Presidency event in Concord, New Hampshire. In this event, Andrew Yang talked about his agenda, and he analyzed some types of jobs and how to deal with debts. He's not taxing the normal people, he's taxing big tech that take away business and doesn't pay taxes. And he said, once day, an Asian man running for president will give you $1,000 per month. Let's hear full speech of Andrew Yang. Every step makes a sound. Oh, at least it did for a minute. Back in New Hampshire. <laughs> Woo! So I say back in New Hampshire. I actually went to high school here. I don't know if you knew that. I went to Phillips Exeter Academy. What do you get as an explanation as to why Donald Trump's our president? Russia, Facebook, racism, Hillary Clinton, the FBI, some mixture of these things, right? They miss the central driver of his victory. And the central driver of his victory is this. We automated away 4 million manufacturing jobs in Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Missouri, Iowa, all the swing states you needed to win and did win. Now here in New Hampshire, you experienced the loss of your automation job, your manufacturing job a little bit earlier, like uh, maybe 20, 30 years ago. But in the Midwest and the South, this was relatively recent. And if you dig into the voter district data, you find that there's a straight line up between the adoption of industrial robots in a voting area and the movement to Trump. It's the strongest correlation anyone can find. We're in the third inning of the greatest economic transformation in the history of our country, what experts are calling the fourth industrial revolution. It wiped out 4 million manufacturing jobs, and now it's going to spread to retail, call centers, fast food, truck driving, and on and on through the economy. How many of you have noticed stores closing where you live here in New Hampshire? And why are those stores closing? One word answer, Amazon. Amazon is soaking up $20 billion in commerce every single year. How much did Amazon pay in taxes last year? Zero. That is the math, New Hampshire. They soak up $20 billion pay zero in taxes, and 30% of your stores and malls close. What is the most common job here in New Hampshire and around the country? Retail. Retail, retail clerk. The average retail clerk is a 39-year-old woman making between $9 and $11 an hour. What is her next opportunity going to be when the store or mall closes? <laughs> is there a fulfillment center? When you call a big customer service line and you get the software, the bot, what do you do? Zero, 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 human, 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 as fast as possible, right? I do the exact same thing. But in two or three years, the software is going to sound like this. Hey, Andrew, how's it going? What can I do for you? It'll be seamless, efficient, delightful. You might not even know it's software. What's that going to mean for the two and a half million Americans who work in call centers right now for a living who make $14 an hour? Yeah, as soon as AI, and you don't even need real AI to do this customer service job. You just need a very sophisticated decision tree uh, and uh, an algorithm that says, OK, this is the next voice prompt you use. That's not real intelligence. That's just a bunch of decisions. The software can actually even detect the changes in the tone of your voice. They can tell if you're getting irritated. And they can go down a different road. The software should be good enough where it might be better than me. Because I hate to say this. This is going to say something about me as a person. But occasionally, you get irritated at the human. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, or move on to diamond sometimes, you know, we're all, well, human. When the AI can outperform one call center worker, that doesn't affect one call center worker. That affects possibly hundreds of thousands of call center workers. I spoke at a conference of 70 CEOs in New York City, and I asked them, how many of you are looking at having AI replace your back office call center workers? You know how many hands went up out of 70? 70. All 70. You could actually fire that CEO if they didn't use the software. Think about that for a sec. If the software truly can replace your back office clerical functions, your customer service functions, then you don't use the software 
they will fire you in the next quarter because you are not optimizing for your company's bottom line. Driving a truck is the most common job in New Hampshire and 28 other states. There are three and a half million truckers in this country, and my friends in California are working on trucks that can drive themselves. They say they're closing in. They say they're 98% of the way there. Now, 2% error rate is very, very high. You can't have semi-trucks smashing into things 2% of the time. <laughs> and the uh, self-driving trucks are really bad at something called snow. <laughs> because when the snow covers the highway markings, then the computer's not sure what to do. Because if you think about it, like, what are they picking up? They just like, need the highway markings. So how are they going to get the last 2%? Do you remember the first time you watched TV on your cell phone? Do you remember that feeling? You're like, wow, we can do that now? So that's 3G. We're in the process of rolling out 5G. Around here, I think they can get the last 2% is they want to equip the trucks with teleoperating software so that when the truck's not sure what to do, it signals a teleoperator in a warehouse in Nevada. And then the person in Nevada then beams into the truck and plays it like a video game. Because the truck has cameras on it so that you essentially are in your seat in Nevada and you can just see out the front of the truck as if you're in the cab. And then when the computer's sure what to do, it, it then says beep, 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 and then you beam back out. What do you think the ratio is going to be between teleoperators in Nevada and the three and a half million truckers? Maybe 5%, 10%. What's that going to mean for the 3.5 million truckers and the 7 million Americans who work in truck stops, motels, and diners that rely upon the truckers getting out and having a meal? If you're a truck driver, you have to stop after 14 hours. Your truck will actually keep you from going any further so you can go, get out, go out and take a nap, essentially. The average truck driver is a 49-year-old man. 94% of truckers are men. Average education is high school or one year of college. Tens of thousands of them are ex-military. So how do we think this is going to play out? Only 13% of truck drivers are in a union. So if you think there's going to be some grand negotiation, you'll be disappointed. 87% of the truckers belong to very small mom and pop businesses. They've taken out personal loans to buy a few trucks. They've hired a few drivers. That's the, the normal truck driving business. I don't even know a truck driver, so you know what I'm talking about. So again, we're in the third inning of this transformation, and by the time it gets to inning four, five, six, these other issues will start cascading. So I took these issues to Washington, D.C. My first move was not to run for president, uh, because I'm not crazy. <laughs> so my first move was I took my facts, my figures, my book, my PowerPoint, and I went to our leaders in Washington, D.C., and I said, what are we going to do? The American people don't understand what's happening to us. We're scapegoating immigrants for issues that immigrants have nothing to do with. And what do you think the folks in Washington, D.C. said to me when I said, what are we going to do? <laughs> Number one, we cannot talk about that. Number two, we should study that further. And number three, the most common was, we must educate and retrain all Americans for the jobs of the future. That sounds pretty responsible, that last one. You don't have to be like, oh, we're all set then, and just like, we'll walk on out. But I looked at the studies. You all want to guess how effective the government-funded retraining programs were for manufacturing workers? Zero to 15 percent. How many of you all studied economics like I did? I studied economics at Brown University. All right, so what did our economics textbook say would happen if you got rid of 4 million manufacturing jobs to those workers? They would be retrained, reskilled, moved, find new jobs, invisible hand, economy growth. You all remember that, macroeconomics? So then you dig in, okay, what actually happened in real life to the 4 million manufacturing workers? Turns out that half of them left the workforce and never worked again. And of that half, about half filed for disability. And then we saw record surges in suicides and drug overdoses in those communities to the point that American life expectancy has declined for the last three years in a row. You all want to know the last time America's life expectancy declined for three years in a row? The Spanish flu of 1918, 100 years ago. It took a global pandemic to reduce our life expectancy three years in a row, and we are there again now. None of this was in my economics textbook. It did not say you get rid of these jobs, the workers go home, start drinking themselves to death, vote for Donald Trump. Like, none of that was in the book. <laughs> but that is what happened in real life. And what happened to the manufacturing workers will now happen to the truckers, but even dialed up. Because manufacturing workers, 70% men, more diverse. Truckers, 94% men, and not very flexible. I went to a truck stop. I've been to truck stops. And if you were to say, hey, I'm here to retrain you, they'd be more likely to punch you in the face than sign up. <laughs> it's just real. A lot of these guys become, became truck drivers because they didn't want to do anything else. So this is the reality of the situation we're in. 
And the reason I'm here with you all is that it's up to the people of New Hampshire to take a different vision to the rest of the country as soon as possible. First, a genuine understanding of the scope of our problems. And then second, real solutions. So what am I talking about when I say vision, solutions? If you were here today, at some point you heard this. There's an Asian man running for president who wants to give everyone $1,000. <laughs> Remember that? Remember the first time you heard that? And the first time you heard that, you're like, ha ha, that's a gimmick. That's too good to be true. But this is a deeply American idea that's been with us since our founding. Thomas Paine was for it at the very beginning of the country, called it the Citizens' Dividend. Martin Luther King championed it in the 60s, and it is what he was fighting for when he was assassinated in 1968. In his 1967 book, Chaos Our Community, he said, we need a guaranteed minimum income, not just for African Americans, but for all Americans. Milton Friedman and a thousand economists endorsed it in the 70s, and it was so mainstream that it passed the U.S. House of Representatives twice in 1971 under Richard Nixon. The Family Assistance Plan would have guaranteed every family a certain income level. And then 11 years later, one state actually passed a dividend where now everyone in that state gets between one and $2,000 a year, no questions asked. And what state is that? Oil. And how do they pay for it? Oil. And what is the oil of the 21st century? Technology. Technology, that's right. Data, AI, software. Right now, it just came out that data is more valuable than oil. What they're doing in Alaska with oil money, we can do for everyone in New Hampshire and everyone in the country with technology money. What this would mean is that this would give rural areas a real path forward. It would create over 10,000 jobs right here in New Hampshire, and it would start to recognize the work that we do that right now the market ignores. And what do I mean by that? Right now my wife is at home with our two young boys, one of whom is autistic. What is her work valued at every day? Zero. Zero. What does the market value her work at? Zero. And we know that's perverse. We know the work she's doing. I was off the trail for a couple of days taking care of our kids. You know what I said after two days? <laughs> Get me back on the presidential trail. <laughs> and anyone who's a parent knows exactly what I'm talking about. The hardest work there is, one of the most vital work there is. And we're valuing it at zero. Even the inventor of GDP said, this is a terrible measurement of national well-being. We should never use this at. So what are we doing 100 years later following GDP off a cliff? Raise your hand again if you run a business or an organization. Imagine if you had the wrong measurements for your business or organization. <laughs> That's where we are right now. Self-driving trucks will be great for GDP, terrible for a lot of Americans. So if you wanted to actually measure how we're doing more effectively, what measurement would you actually use instead of something like GDP? Mental health and freedom from substance abuse. That would be, and if you said that got better, then we'd actually be thrilled. Educational outcomes, childhood success. How about clean air and clean water? How about income and affordability? Wellness and uh, life expectancy? Again, what good is GDP if your life expectancy is getting shorter? That's like the clearest sign that we're on the wrong track. Uh, criminality, recidivism, reintegration into society. Believe it or not, we have numbers for all of these things. And as your president, it will be my joy to go down the street to the Bureau of Economic Analysis and say, hey, GDP, really old, kind of out of date. We're going to update it to the American scorecard. And then every year at the State of the Union, I will present to you, the American people, how we're doing by the measurements that matter. I'm going to be the first president to use a PowerPoint deck at the State of the Union. <laughs> <laughs> So this is the plan, this is the vision how we can actually solve the problems that got Donald Trump elected and start to address really the symptoms. Because right now we're all attacking the symptoms and there's a disease, there's root cause. And a lot of the disease is this mindset of insecurity and scarcity that has swept our country. Studies have shown that a mindset of financial insecurity actually reduces your functional IQ by 13 IQ points or one standard deviation. So if you have this nagging feeling that this country is getting less intelligent, less optimistic, less reasonable, more subject to bad ideas. We are. Because 78% of us are living paycheck to paycheck. Almost half of us can't afford an unexpected four or $500 bill. And in that context, you become subject to much, much lesser decision making. So with your help, we can move the country not left, not right, but forward. That is how we're going to win in 2020. We have to solve the problems that got Donald Trump elected. If you look back on 2015, what did he say? He said, we're going to make America great again. And then what did Hillary say? It's already great. And that did not work. Now, he got the problems right, but his solutions were the opposite of what we need. His solutions were, we're going to build a wall. We're going to turn the clock back. We're going to bring the old jobs back. We have to do the opposite of those things. We have to turn the clock forward.
We have to accelerate our economy and society as fast as possible. We have to evolve in how we think about work and value. And I am the ideal candidate for that job because the opposite of Donald Trump is an Asian man who likes math. Yeah. <laughs> what does math stand for in New Hampshire? Thanks for listening. Please subscribe our channel to update the latest news in America.